Lewis Insider. This is Matt Faircloth, and welcome, welcome, welcome to the Cashflow Digest. Yet again, guys, this is a program that's dedicated for you, you listener, generating lots and lots of cash flow out of your portfolio, out of your investment business. Cash flow is king. Cash flow is going to become even more prevalent as we move into a changing marketplace. So this show is all about how you can generate more cash flow for yourself so that you can build up your investment goals. We're going to be bringing on a great guest today that's going to be talking to us about something that is always a prevalent initiative in real estate investing. And as the market continues to shift, it's going to be something that's going to be even more prevalent. We just talked uh, earlier in the show about a uh, shift that's having that, that's happening in the multifamily world. A small segment of the multifamily world is going to be experiencing some real distress. But that distress is not limited to multifamily. Distress is limited is not limited. It is in all factors of real estate investing. And the concept of wholesaling is a way that you as a real estate investor can help somebody out that's in distress and also help out people that are trying to build their portfolio, right? So we're going to be talking to Mike DeHaan. So let's bring in Mike so he can talk to us all about wholesaling, what it is and how you two can get involved in it. Mike, how are you, man? Welcome to the show. Good. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, you're welcome for, for for getting on, man. How are you today? You doing well? Doing well. You can't complain. Yeah, yeah it's I'm been a you know, big 2023. So we're just wrapping that up and sort of getting ready for this next year, which I think is going to be very interesting in the real interesting, estate Interesting, to say the least. That's I've, I listened to a lot of shows and predictions of people what think that 2024 is going to be like. And interesting, lots of changes, lots of this, lots of that, or one of those are pretty much a recurring theme that I hear from anybody that's reading tea leaves on the year. For those that haven't heard of you, tell us who you are so we can get into the show. Sure. Uh, yeah, my name is Mike DeHaan. I am a investor slash wholesaler slash buy and hold guy. Done kind of everything under the sun. I've done a lot of house flips. I own about 14 million in real estate, mostly in residential and small multifamily stuff. And I've done about 350 transactions in the last four years, all off market direct to seller. And I run a nationwide wholesaling business now. And I also have uh, my show, The Collecting Keys Podcast, which is like a business focused real estate show. And uh, yeah, those are kind of my two main businesses right now. Sweet. I love that. I love that. And the Collecting Keys Podcast, guys, check that out. Could you just like, quickly, what is wholesaling, right? Yeah. Just, just for, for folks to understand, or even just remind them what it is we're talking about. So, so just, mm -hmm. just quickly, what is the vehicle of wholesaling as a real estate investing uh, mechanism? Yeah. So basically as a wholesaler, we are professional deal finders, right? So what we do is we market for and we find distressed properties or distressed owners that need to offload their properties in a sort of atypical fashion. Usually we're being able to close quickly, buying you know, sight unseen or as is. And how we make money as a wholesaler is we secure a purchase and sale agreement with the seller and then we find a buyer and they buy the contract from us through what's called an assignment contract mm -hmm. right and we make money on the spread so just to put it into numbers let's say that we have a house that's worth two hundred thousand dollars but needs a little bit of work we would go and we would get a purchase and sale agreement with a seller for one hundred thousand dollars to buy this property they need to close in three weeks the property needs like a decent remodel you know they just want to walk away from it we get the purchase and sale for hundred thousand for this two hundred thousand dollar house but it's still fixed up we go and we find a flipper or another investor who's willing to buy it for one hundred and ten thousand dollars they basically bring the $110,000 to closing. And then the seller at, at closing, the seller gets their $100,000. The buyer gets their house for $110,000. And we make a $10,000 difference on the HUD. And that's where we basically make our profit. So we never have to bring any money into the deal. We get paid through the transactions like everyone else. The buyer doesn't have to bring money ahead of time before the deal closes. And we're basically just another line item, almost like a broker, except the difference being that we are unlicensed and we are able to basically make our money depending on how good of the opportunity that we can negotiate on the seller side and also how good of, how well we can find something for a buyer in terms of like their buy box. Typically people yeah. that like the deal want to pay a little bit more. And, and I've, I've heard many, many wholesalers that I like and respect, you know, explain this to me. Cause I've said like, well, how are they able to resell the property if they don't have a broker's license? And what it's, what it's been explained to me is that you're able to do it because you have a controlling interest. Right? Correct. Um, we have an equitable interest in the contract. Yeah, the you get a contract, contract, right? And so if I were wholesale. <laughs> And, I, and back in my day, when I used to do a lot of a lot of high velocity stuff in, in real estate, I would see a wholesalers wholesaling stuff that you would also see on the MLS. And these were not folks that knew exactly what they were doing. They were wholesaling stuff that they did not have equitable interest in. They were just you know almost like trying to bird dog or find or you know point to a deal that they didn't have any control over. But once you've got that equitable interest, the control of the property, the ability to close on it and buy it, meaning you've got it airport locked up, right? That is what enables you to then go and offer that contract to others as long as there's a signability in the contract. So Correct. this, this yep. is the like layman on my side of it, understanding it, right? So yep. you're, yeah, uh, you're, to you're totally right. And the difference between us and a realtor is that you're, not only do we have equitable interest, we also have like an obligation to the seller, right? So some wholesalers will do shady stuff and they will have these different like ex escape clauses and things in their contract. You don't have to do that way. Like our general philosophy has always been that we contract things at prices that we are willing to buy them if needed. And again, our long-term play has always been as buy and hold investors. And so we secure contracts at prices that we're willing to buy them at. And then if it's a situation where we are 
unable to perform on it. We're not like, we can't get it together. We can't find a bar or whatever. We have to come out earnest money. You know, the seller can technically take us to court if there was any sort of damages that went into play. Sorry, that came up with it. Like if they like moved out of the property and then we bailed at the last minute, they could potentially sue us for damages with that. So we do take on more risk. So that's, so that's something that's always important to keep in mind with this. That's also why we're able to earn more money because there's more implied risk with it. A lot of new people, they come in and they kind of dismiss that and pretend like it won't happen, but stuff like that can go awry if you're not careful. Yeah, yeah. So for someone that wants to consider wholesale, and, and like, let me even like, let's not even go there, right? Wholesaling is obviously, there, there's help on the buying side that you're giving someone by like, hey, you're likely to strike. Like if I want to sell the primary residence that I live in and I've got plenty of money and I'm willing to wait for the buyer to come along and give me the right number for my house, I'm certainly not going to be a candidate to work with a wholesaler, right? Mm -hmm. But- if I need to sell by next Tuesday and I need to, and, and I've got a uh, bank coming after me or debt or whatever it is, and I need a no questions asked sale and I need to close really, really quickly and I need the money or I'm underwater, whatever it may be, the wholesalers likely can help in, in a lot of those fashions. So not every buyer is a good wholesaler candidate, but some mm -hmm. are, right? Yep. As a wholesaler, how do you determine who is a good candidate and who's not, right? Because you, you really wouldn't want to just go call everybody that's, that has their house listed or everybody that says they want to sell and determine if they're a good candidate or not. There's got to be some mechanisms to determine what a good wholesaling buy side lead would be and what's not. What are some parameters that you talk about? Yeah, you're, you're referring to the seller, like who we market to. Yeah, well, who, yeah, right. The, the, the first yeah. leg of the trade. I, sure. Again, I, I know just enough to be dangerous about yeah. this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. talk about there's two legs, right? There's the selling leg and the buying leg, right? Mm -hmm. Like, right. So the, on the first leg in finding that deal, what are some parameters that you've used to find like really good qualified leads? Because as a wholesaler, you, you know, you got to find the right opportunity that, 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 that needs, maybe needs to close quickly, quickly. And in exchange for that velocity, there's a discount, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. how do you find those deals? Yeah. So a lot of people approach it different ways. There's yeah. some people that do this through relationships. You know, they build like a large relationship of other realtors that just like have leads that come in. Some mm -hmm. people will go on the MLS and they look for different things. Our approach has always been to do a mass marketing approach. Mm -hmm. So very basically what we do is we go and we pull public lists, which you can find pretty much everywhere. Like there, we use a, a platform called PropStream, which is a mm -hmm. public list provider that you can go and, and you can pull all kinds of data. It works better in some markets than other markets. Some markets you have to go to the county court house and do these different things. But what we do is we pull lists for people that have publicly recorded bankruptcies. We pull lists for people that have um, extensive liens on their properties, that have code violations that have been marked by the city, properties that have been marked vacant, a bunch of different, like th there's, there's about 15 or 16 different lists that we pull that are all sort of mm. different back, sort of like back office motivations that they might have that aren't necessarily going to be visible from outside the house. Okay. And you can get these pretty much anywhere. And then what we do is we, we get these lists. We mass market to them through cold calling and direct mail. And then as people choose to engage with our brand, we have a team of people that, you know, talks with them, hears their situation, tries to figure out if selling the property will help them out with whatever financial or personal distress that they're dealing with. And if it turns out that it will, then we can negotiate a transaction with them. And basically we are a solutions-based business, right? Someone's facing a bankruptcy and they are about to like lose everything, but selling their house like in the next two weeks allows them to avoid that by paying off their debts. Mm. And so like we're a solutions-based business, but our payment, our collateral is the property in question that we're marketing for. Got it. So does, I, you know, I, I hate getting letters in the mail. Right. And, and those that are in financial distress are likely getting a lot more letters than you and I are. Right. Like they're getting stacks of letters from creditors and for everybody that's trying to get their attention. Right. How do you, first of all, it seems like, you know, mailing campaigns still work. Right. Mm -hmm. How do you get somebody's attention if they've got like a whole stack and, you know, not for nothing, if they're in financial distress, most of that, most of the letters in that stack are letters they don't want to open. Right. Mm -hmm. How do you make sure that your letter gets considered? Cause that's the one that you're actually trying to help them out. Right. How do you, how do you, you know, do it sounds like letters still go. I was going to originally ask you, do letters get open? I was like, well, if he's doing it, I guess they do, right? So, how do you get the, them to open the letter and call you? Like, yeah. You know, because what's the point of even doing it if they won't? Sure. Yeah. So, direct mail was seventy four percent of our deals last year. It is our our largest deal source, and I think that the reason for that, I mean, people do open letters, but direct mail is so powerful because you think about the seller story. Yeah. They are choosing to reach out to you first. So, even though we send them a letter, they are receiving it. They are the 1% that is choosing to open it, mm -hmm. right? They are at that point looking up our company because it's all freshly branded and then they are engaging with us directly. So they're already a warmer lead versus like a cold call or an SMS or something like that where you're kind of like invading their space, right? You're mm -hmm. calling them unsolicited. Like that's never going to be as productive of a conversation. And so the way that you stay competitive with direct mail is through consistency and professionalism, right? And so if you send like somebody one letter 
you're right. They're probably not going to necessarily engage with it. If yeah. all of a sudden they're getting things from you four five, six months in a row, they're going to start to remember you. They're going to start mm -hmm. to remember your name, your company name, and they're going to be more likely to engage with you. Cause they say like with marketing, what somebody has to be exposed to you 17 times before yeah. they are willing to engage with your brand. So leading with that brand first, that sort of consistent outreach is major. And then also having a professional brand and some sort of like wider follow-up process is huge as well, or some sort of way to retarget them. So what we do is we have like a fully professionally built website. You can like see our team on there. You can see, you know, who we are. We have testimonials and things on that site. It doesn't look like some sketchy site that's like made for TV kind of thing. So they can go and they can research our brand and they can see that we look like a credible group. And then once they go onto our website, we retarget them on Google and social media because we have like a pixel installed and we have these, you know, the Google retargeting installed. So now not only have they inquired about us, but now they start to see us everywhere, right? right. So they start to see us in their YouTube videos and their recipe articles and their, you know, news articles, whatever they're reading. Right. And so they get a ton of exposure to us very, very quickly. And that allows us to be kind of the top of mind group out of all the other people that are mailing the exact same list. Because of that comfort level to mm -hmm. eventually research your company a little bit further and everything yeah. like that. So, so I want to comment on something because yet again, know enough to be dangerous about this whole thing, but there are others out there and it doesn't sound like you do this. And if you do, I get it. I get why they would do it, but I like your model of sending a professionally branded letter. We're a real company. We're well-funded. We can do, we, we can do what we say we're going to do. Right. I like that. There's other philosophies that I've seen that our folks are sending out like, you know, either what actually is or what appears to be a handwritten letter, mm -hmm. you know, meaning like, you know, I'm your, I'm your, you know, friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, so to speak. Right. And I want to help you out because I live around the corner from your property. We've gotten those letters, like either actual handwritten letters or pretend to be handwritten letters on our apartment buildings, you mm -hmm. know, saying, Hey, I live local and I want to buy your apartment building. And there's that, they try and create that, you know, identification level with the seller that like, Hey, I'm just like you, I'm just a, just a, you know, just a working person trying to make it, trying to make it happen. Right. Is that something you do also? And if not, why not? Yes, yes and no, right? So we we you have to have like a call to action and a selling point in your marketing. Yeah, right? yeah. And so we we have a national business. When mm -hmm. we started, we were just here in Spokane, Washington, where I live, and mm -hmm. we would definitely lean on the local thing a lot more. Yeah. Because like also too culturally, that was something that people here really valued. They wanted to be able to shake your hands for see who they're working I with. Get it. As we've gotten national and we've gone to some of these larger areas, like we do some stuff in Florida, we do stuff like Jacksonville, you know, Houston, Phoenix, those markets people don't necessarily care about that as much. They're used to a lot of outside business coming there. So what we do instead of trying to act like, oh, we're like your best friends next door, things like that, we, yeah. we give the call to action of like, you know, we're heavily experienced. We can give you complete flexibility on the closing. You know, we're super reliable. Like those are the kind of things that we go for. And then a lot of it comes down to the customer experience after they enter our ecosystem, right? So when they call in, they we have a 24-7 American-based call center that fields the calls for them. So they're immediately talking to an American person. It's not like they're calling and like leaving a voicemail and they're getting a call back from a VA, things like that, right? And then same with all of our sales team. We have five sales members that work for us, closers, and they basically are the owner of that client and they build that relationship. So they're not getting passed between different people. They're not having like a, you know, kind of disheveled sort of experience with the business like a lot of our, our competitors provide. And, you know, that makes it so that it's like a little bit more of a seamless transition and, and we don't have to necessarily like pretend like we're local, we're your best friends, all those sort of things, because we immediately yeah. just look more legit from the start, if that makes sense. Love that. Love that. What are some like other, aside from like the the, the letter, you're right, it doesn't, it maybe works when you're really small, but it's hard to scale, right? What are some other mistakes you hear people either on the buying side or on the selling side or whatever it is? Could you riff off a few mistakes that we can discuss that you hear wholesalers make for those mm -hmm. that are trying to scale a wholesaling business? You know, let's not, let's help them out by like not allowing them to make these mistakes that you see a lot of people do. The biggest mistake everyone makes right off the bat, and this is especially true for engineering people that try to get into this, <laughs> is they go in and they focus on the asset, right? And so yeah. what, the, what they do is they will walk into the house that has like the widow, older, late, older lady that's lived in the house for 40 years, right? Her husband just died a month ago. The house is in shambles. She has no next of kin, no anything. And they go, okay, ma'am, so we're going to have to do the roof. We're going to have to do the kitchen. We're going to have to do the bathroom. We're going to have to like redo all the flooring. There's a lot of work needs going here. This is what we're going to be willing to offer in the house. Right. They didn't answer where they didn't ask where she's going to go. What are her plans? What right. does she actually need out of this to be able to live out of the rest of her days? You know, yeah. like, does yeah. she have any like alternatives to this? That would be a better option. And so they forget about the human element, which is really what the whole purpose of this business is, you know? And I think that that's one of the reasons that a lot of, so, so I, I think that every Serious real estate business should have some kind of wholesaling direct to seller element, even if it's not your main exit strategy, because it gives you access to better long term buy and hold deals. And it also gives you the way to monetize the deals that come into your pipeline that you don't want if you know how to mm. find buyers, right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of people avoid it 
because they don't understand that it is, or they, or they don't necessarily want to interject it because it's not like necessarily a real estate business anymore. Like fundamentally we're a marketing and sales business that is like real estate focused. Yeah. Right. And that's like the number one issue that a lot of people have and challenge when they try to get started is it takes them a long time to kind of get past that or to realize that. Yeah. It's almost like, you know, if you're dealing with that widow and you're like, ah, oh, well, you got a roof leak and your windows are bad. I know your furnace is 10 years old. You know, you're in, in some ways vocalizing things that are your problem. As the totally. Body, right. Ab absolutely. And if anything, you're almost insulting her. Yeah. She's like, yeah, I've been here for 40 are, years. Yeah. It, it is. It is insulting to her because like, mm -hmm. if she could have afforded to fix the roof, she would have, you know. Mm -hmm. Or if she had known the roof was leaking or whatever. And maybe she's down to keep living in the house with the bum furnace if she were to stay there, you know, sure. or with the older furnace or whatever it may be, right? But I love the way you you presented it. Like, well, what are you going to do? Where are you, where are you going next? Well, I want to move closer to where my sister lives. Or I want to move into that retirement home over there. And with my retirement account, if I can get this number for this house plus my retirement account, I can easily move into that retirement community, whatever it is. Like, th th what an interesting conversation that is by not vocalizing your problems. You're mm -hmm. speaking about her problems. And that's sales 101, man. It is. Um, yeah. But you're right. The engineer would go in here and be like, when's the last time you painted these walls? These carpets <laughs> seem to be a little bit old. I'm going to need to shampoo them. Who cares? You yeah. know, that's your problem. <laughs> you know, yeah, like, yeah. Why, why are you doing that? Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, and even after you have the contract signed, right. there's a whole other level of handholding that goes on through these transactions. It's very different from when you're working with somebody who's opted to list their property on the market or has a realtor representing them. Because yeah. um, now, you know, you have the, the widow, older lady that you're now buying her house. There's a great chance that if she can't figure out her next move, we're going to get a week out and she's going to be like, you know what, I'm not comfortable selling my house anymore. And What's very common is that a lot of people will be like, well, I think I got to sue this lady. It's like, you're going to sue this lady for their, for sue this 80 year old widow. Yeah, exactly. For a house that you know that you're buying at a discount. Right. Right. Well, just because circumstances. Like, cause I, I'm sure that comes up. Or if, up they're, if they're not no kids, my mm -hmm. kids are telling me I shouldn't sell or my next door neighbor just sold their house for more than what you're buying mine for. Right. How mm -hmm. do you handle those objections that may come up? Like maybe I, you know, the seller's remorse, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, let's call it that. What do you do? You prevent them from happening in the first place, right? Yeah. So basically from the second you sign that contract, you're like, all right, ma'am, cool. Let's work, let's work together to figure out your next steps. You want to move down to Tampa? Mm -hmm. Great. Let's let's go and look at some homes in Tampa. Like, mm -hmm. like let's let's sit down and like let's look through your options. Do you have somebody that's willing to help you like look at properties if you go fly down there and take a look? Like, what exactly does that look like? And you really treat it as a solution as you're going through the entire process with them. And you're providing a service that they probably aren't going to get anywhere else, especially if they don't have family or they don't have anyone else to support them in their life, which is a lot of people that we work with. And in doing that, we really are providing like a service and we are reducing yeah. the risks for those situations to even occur to begin with. And it's it's funny because wholesalers and off-market investors tend to get kind of a little bit of a bad rap because mm -hmm. the average person, they're like, you just bought a house for $200,000, uh, so a house that's worth $200,000 for $100,000. Like you took equity from that person. It's like, well, yeah. what we gave them is you gave them a guaranteed sale. They didn't have to fix anything up. We helped them move you know we fronted money on their new place so they could get into it you know we did all these things and so often the seller they don't necessarily care that they gave up some money because we gave them the outcome that they really desired and we made it so they didn't have to stress about it they didn't have to yeah. you know worry about any sort of like, turbulence or weird things that were going to be out of their control i love that in some ways my a house has become a burden to some people mm -hmm. right totally. and it's hard for some people to relate to that because it's, it's in some ways the house is a major part of their net worth right it's mm -hmm. a part of their investment it's a part of their you know their financial capacity but for others it's not mm -hmm. and in a lot of ways a house could be a pain in the butt and like, I just need this pain in the butt to go away. And I need somebody like Mike's company to help me get this pain in the butt out of my butt and on and, and on to the next thing. Right. Mm -hmm. um, love that. So Mike, we're this, this half an hour you and I've had together is going by very quickly. So for those that want to hear more about your wholesaling business, I also know that you do teach people how to wholesale and you've got a national network and everything like that. So for those that want to hear more about all that stuff, how do people reach out to you to hear more? I mean, obviously they can check out the Collecting Keys podcast. Let's mention the name one more time. Collecting Keys, guys, if you guys want to get into or expand your wholesaling business, make sure you go listen to that show. But Mike, how do they reach out to you directly? Yeah. So reach out to me directly. The easiest is on Instagram. It's just at Mike underscore invests. That's really easy way to reach out. Send me a DM on there. I post a lot of content on there as well. And if you're not really a social media person, you can also send me an email, just Mike at collectingkeys.com. Mike at collectingkeys.com. Pop him an email and uh, check out his Instagram page too. Mike, thank you for, for being on the show today. Really appreciate this. And I, I, I want to commend you on something. Over my head, it says transforming lives through real estate because I believe that what you and I do as real estate investors has the opportunity to make a difference in the world. There are wholesalers out there that forgot about this, that mm -hmm. forgot that this that this is there. And they're really just out there to scrape every nickel and dime out of people. And, and, and they're going to throw like every rock they can and try and retrade sellers and everything like that. But it doesn't seem like that's what you're in this to do. And I commend you 
for being, I, you're the first wholesaler I've ever talked to that said that they've even gotten in the conversation with a seller about helping them move or where are you going to go? What's next for you? And let me help you make that happen. So kudos to you, man, because you're actually, you're, you're giving wholesalers a good name, which is someone that's helping someone solve a problem. And the bad name that wholesalers have are people that are out there to take advantage. And I, I totally sense that that's not why you're in this. So, so kudos to you, brother. Yeah. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. And it all, it all about intent at the beginning of it. Right. And you know, the yeah. funny thing is, is, is it's never always fun, but it's a solutions business. Like we have to do tricky things. Like, like, especially when me and my business partner were getting started, there were several people that we would help move or we would do things. And we would be at their house at seven o'clock on Saturday morning and we would go into their house. They knew they were moving. They hadn't even packed anything yet. So you know how fun it is to move your own stuff. Now imagine just moving somebody else's stuff and they have 30 years of just things <laughs> that, that they've, that they've never organized. And you're now like going through that. You're dealing with all this weird stuff, but it's, it's the business, right? And it yeah. really is possible to make your town a better place by doing what we do. I love that. Cool. Mike, thanks for being on the show. Right, guys, make sure you reach out to Mike. Those of you guys watching here on Facebook, we have popped a link to Mike's Instagram right there in the show notes. And you can also grab Mike's email from there too. Mike, have a great day, bud. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. You too. Guys, interesting conversation. And I think that like we want to take something home. And this is something my man, Eric Platter said, it's about solving problems, right? And if you as a real estate investor are willing to go forward with an effort and initiative in your mission to solve someone's problem you're dealing with, whether that's your one of your investors, one of your tenants, or someone you're buying a home from as a wholesaler, that is how you're going to generate success and raving fans and maybe even people that are willing to refer what you do to their friends because they get you are out for their best interest. Great conversation with Mike. Hey guys, Matt Faircloth here. Thank you for listening again to the Cash Flow Digest. I really appreciate you guys doing that. If you guys want to hear more about what DeRosa Group has to offer, go to DeRosa Group, D E R O S A Group.com, DeRosa Group.com online. You can hear about all the great things that we offer from an educational standpoint and passive investment standpoint on our website. See you there. And if you guys want to join our online community, DeRosa Insiders on Facebook, where you can watch this program get recorded every Friday at noon Eastern, and you can come on as even a guest or ask questions on the show. We hope to see you guys on our online community, DeRosa Insiders. See you there.